a couple of things we should keep in mind. This is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, the war to end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy. It is also the 75th anniversary of the beginning of World War II with Hitler's invasion of Poland and the deaths of 50 million people. We have to put these matters into perspective. Five years ago, on the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which of course was a great media event in the West because it was uh, an orgy of triumphalism, but how Western democratic values had progressed, uh, had dominated the world, uh, a Russian commentator said, the Berlin Wall may have been dismantled, it's simply been re uh, erected again along the entire western border of Russia, and that in fact is the case. And it's another anniversary this year, it's the 10th anniversary of the largest expansion of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in its history. Uh, seven new members were brought in, all of them in Eastern Europe, three of them former Soviet republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Immediately upon those three Baltic states being brought into NATO, NATO began a series of regular air patrols with warplanes out of Lithuania. Uh, this has been going on for a decade. A Russian commentator, a uh, political figure, mentioned at the time that these planes are a five-minute flight from the second largest city in Russia, St. Petersburg, and not a tremendously longer flight from the capital of Russia, Moscow. I can only imagine if, a, if a, another country were to station warplanes within striking distance of New York and Washington, D.C., what the reaction would be in the American media as well as amongst the American government. But this is what's been steadily mounting, inexorably mounting. Uh, President Obama remarked on the occasion of receiving his Nobel Peace Prize yet, uh, identified the United States as, in his words, the world's sole military superpower. That term should send chills down your back that anything like that could exist at all, much less that the person who identifies himself, and incidentally in that same speech as the commander in chief of that world's sole military superpower, boast of it, you know, should have been a wake up call to the world. Uh, Fifteen years ago, three things happened simultaneously. The first ever NATO summit was held in the, the first NATO summit ever to be held in the United States occurred in Washington, D.C. To, ce to celebrate the 50th anniversary of a military bloc that was created ostensibly to defend itself against the Soviet Union, which at that time had not existed for eight years. It also marked the first absorption of former Warsaw Pact countries into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. Yet also, uh, NATO now, not having to worry about a Soviet Union or any other military power that could defend itself, uh, launched a blistering 78-day uh, unprovoked air war against a sovereign nation, Yugoslavia. You know, when I see uh, fascist thugs running through the capital city of a European country, it's evocative of seeing a European capital, Belgrade, in flames being bombed for the first time since Hitler's Blitzkrieg Wars. This is what we're talking about. There is no way of exaggerating the severity of what we're, we're facing right now. Now, in the interim, NATO continued to expand. It has now absorbed 12 countries in a decade from 1999 to 2009. That is an increase by 75%. This, again, if you read its charter, supposedly existed to maintain peace in Europe and so forth, right, to, uh, you know, the Soviet Empire. I mention that term because it's very much in the news now. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who in recent weeks has seen comments in mainstream U.S. corporate media, uh, such as the Russian Red Army has moved into Crimea, <laughs> into the Soviet Republic of Crimea. I d this is true. Uh, they are either trying to evoke Cold War nightmarish images, or they're intentionally uh, distorting this, or they have not grown out of their own Cold War mindset to any degree so they can still use outdated terminology like that. A couple of things. The uh, USS Donald Cook guided missile destroyer coming into the Black Sea. Uh, that's not just any warship. It's, by the way, the third guided missile warship from the United States to go into the Black Sea uh, since the crisis in the Ukraine. There is a convention in 1936 called the Montura Convention that expressly prohibits warships of a certain size or larger to go into the Black Sea or to stay there uh, over a limited period of time. The U.S. is in clear violation of that convention, and the Ru Russian political figures have notified them of that. But what the USS Donald Cook is, is what in military terminology is called an Arleigh Burke uh, class guided missile destroyer. It is part of the U.S. NATO uh, interceptor missile system in Europe, what's uh, euphemistically referred to as a European phase adaptive approach. That is. It is the fulcrum upon which the U.S. is erecting a global 
International Interceptor Missile System that will make Russia, China, and Iran incapable of retaliating should the U.S. strike them with a strategic strike first. Plain and simple. And I'm sure in uh, military command in Moscow, they interpret the uh, placing of U.S. guided missile uh, destroyers near their border, Russia borders the Black Sea, in exactly those terms. We also have to keep in mind, and this, uh, we have to do a lot of unnecessary work and waste a lot of time refuting lies instead of uh, talking about what's actually going on. But let's keep in mind, the U.S. has expanded the amount, they've taken over the rotation of the Baltic Air Patrol, as I remarked. Uh, up until recently, it was four warplanes from each NATO country. The U.S. is not going to have 12. Britain's going to send four. France is going to send four. You're going to have 20, 30 or more uh, warplanes right near Russia's northwest uh, border. The U.S. is now sending 18 F-16s to Poland. The U.S. acquired, after the 1904, uh, 2004 expansion of NATO, four new military bases in Bulgaria, four new military bases in Romania. That is eight bases, several of them on th three major air bases that have been used for the wars against Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, and are poised now to intervene in any uh, military conflict with Russia. Look, the uh, bases have been secured decades ago through NATO expansion. The military hardware, including interceptor missiles in the Polish city of Murad, Patriot Advanced Capability 3 interceptor missiles, 35 miles from Russian territory, the exclave of Kaliningrad, this has been built up long in advance of the Ukrainian crisis. The Ukrainian crisis is simply the pretext for the U.S. and its NATO allies uh, moving uh, more military equipment up to the Russian border, not simply to contain it. There's no need to contain Russia. It is to besiege Russia. And there's only one reason you besiege a country, either to starve it out or to attack it. And nothing less severe is at stake right now, and that's why it is so demonstrably important that we organize against this, this rhetoric that, you know, in many ways is even worse than the depths of the Cold War, as I remember. But I've had occasion to mention a couple people here today. This evokes memories not so much of, uh, you know, previous crises we can think of uh, in the last 40 or 50 years. This is almost something tantamount to what it felt like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if anyone can remember it. It's the most serious potential for a direct military confrontation between the world's two major nuclear powers and one that was gratuitously and recklessly initiated by the United States in the manner that it was described, where Assistant uh, Secretary of State for U European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Nuland, uh, was caught on tape, she doesn't deny it, in addition to, pardon the expletive, but you know, F the EU, talks about exactly who's going to come into control after they've overthrown the government in Ukraine, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, you saw him, and that's indeed, you mean they're following orders. She ordered the coup, she ordered the, the, uh, who is going to control the junta in Kiev, and now the U.S. is moving in. Incidentally, military exercises around Lviv in uh, northwestern Ukraine, the nationalist headquarters, uh, will be coming up in two months. It's called Rabbit, uh, Rap, should be Rabbit, Rapid Trident 2014. U.S. and other NATO allies are going to be there. Uh, almost every year for the last 10 years, the U.S. and NATO have led uh, naval military exercises in Crimea, I suppose this year they won't, uh, called Sea Breeze. There have been, F and one last thing I want to say, because I think this is very, very important. The conflict in Ukraine was triggered, it was planned. And it was triggered on November 21st of last year when then President, by the way, whatever we think of him, legally elected, internationally elected head of state of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, announced not that he was not going to sign an association agreement with the European Union, but that he was deferring the signing of that. I cannot believe. I mean, I, I don't, I've been to Kiev, I, I've met Ukrainians, I believe they're as politically sophisticated as anyone else in the world, but I cannot for a moment believe that because an obscure agreement that I'm sure nine out of ten U Ukrainians never even heard discussed was being postponed, that people went out by the tens of thousands in the streets of Kiev, set the city on fire, murdered 14 police officers, sent 86 of them to the hospital, uh, brandishing swastikas and variations thereof, and overthrow a government. I can't believe they did that based on the, you know, the association agreement with the European Union. But anyone who's looked at that association agreement, there is a very strong military component to it. It suggests the further integration of Ukraine into Western military structures, including European Union battle groups. And for anyone who still sustains the illusion that there is a major difference between European Union uh, uh, foreign policy and NATO foreign policy, there is none. 
They are united over, under a program in the 1990s called the Berlin Plus Agreement that uh, you know, integrated the militaries. Just a few weeks ago, a British general, Richard Sharif, retired as second uh, major military commander of NATO, Deputy uh, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. He was simultaneously the commander of uh, Operation Atalanta, which is a European Union a naval operation in the, in the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, which complements NATO's Operation Ocean Shield. These roles and the militaries are uh, interchangeable, they're coterminous. So what we're looking at here is that, and it, last thing I think we have to remember, presidential elections were scheduled in the Ukraine for a year ago last March, uh, last month. If things were so intolerable, right, if the oligarchs, who are a nasty bit of business, no question about it, on either side of the aisle, if the oligarchs or Yanukovych or whomever somebody opposed, you know, was such a big problem, what would we be told here to do? To organize an opposition candidate and vote him out of office. You know, if anyone here who is defending what happened in the Ukraine, Mr. McCain and Mr. Murphy and, and Newland and company, were to advocate that we replicate the uh, Ukrainian model here in the United States, where incidentally, I'm sure Obama's ratings are lower than Yanukovych's were when he was overthrown. If anyone was to advocate that we replicate the Ukrainian model in Washington, they would be taken out in handcuffs and, and uh, you know, subjected to trial for treason. This is what, you know, we've allowed, you know, what people have allowed themselves to tolerate. Uh, the NATO needs to be disbanded. We screamed that in the streets of Chicago two years ago. Uh, uh, I think this gives us, if I could sum, summarize it this way, this is a culmination of 15 years of NATO expansion, and this, I fear, is the fifth, is the final act of U.S. plans to contain uh, and, and ultimately attack the only country in the world that has a strategic military force capable of defending itself against the United States. I think that's what the geopolitical background of this crisis is, and I think it's, it's urgent beyond belief. The American people don't want war with Russia. They certainly don't want to be nuclear ins insinuated. Uh, and what we need to do is, is to do m demand uh, the cessation of American intervention in Ukraine and all other countries, given our track record. Uh, and whether that's political subversion or outright military aggression, as in the case, there's a great banner there about Ukraine, Venezuela, and Syria linking the three. There's no question in my mind these three are coordinated, and the offensives against the governments in all three countries were uh, not only simultaneously, but I think related. At any rate, uh, I applaud everyone's uh, efforts in building an anti-war movement. It has never been more necessary than it is right now.